I see we have a lot of great folks here today. Um, and we are so happy to be here with Christopher Wild from QZAP, the Queer Zine Archive Project. Um, I'm Elvis Bakaitis, Interim Head of Reference at the Graduate Center Library. I'm here with Kate Angel, um, Adjunct Reference Librarian and notable GC colleague. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and do a little mini intro, but before we get started with that, um, I just wanna say that we would love for this to be interactive and happy and fun as zines are. So feel free to anytime put a question in the chat. Um, if you want to use the raise hand feature in Zoom, you could do that and we can kind of pivot to you. Um, but yeah, so I'll just go ahead and share my screen and thanks for being here with us today. All right. Let's see. One more second, sorry, there we go. Um, great, so welcome everyone again to the Meanery's Library Conversation Series um, here at the Graduate Center, which is in New York City. Um, you can join us every Thursday. I know it's not 1 p.m. right now, but um, mostly at 1 p.m. Um, and we're hoping to have this be a lively showcase of ideas, focusing on research by different scholars, um, and highlighting the role of the library in all of this work. The series is inspired by pioneering mathematician Mina spiegel -Rees. Um, So she was very active oops, in the Graduate Center's um, early years as the CUNY's first unit dean of graduate studies and also the Graduate Center's first president. So we named the library after her and also this conversation series. Um, we're here today with Chris Wild, who is the co-founder with Milo Miller of the Queer Zine Archive Project, QZAP. It is based in Milwaukee, and the mission of the Cuisine Archive Project is to establish a living history archive of past and present queer zines and to encourage current and emerging zine publishers to continue to create, which I really love as an archive that's established with a future in mind. So this is very cool. Um, again, I'm here with Kate Angel, co-host, adjunct reference librarian, um, and both of us are co-founders of the NYC Feminist Zine Fest, and longtime fans of QZAP. So um, we hope you all are excited as well. And so yeah, if you'd like to ask questions, just drop them in the chat anytime and we can circle back. Um, you can use that raise hand feature and we can come to you if you'd like to ask a question live on camera um, or via audio, we, that would be really great. And yeah, so thank you again for joining us today. Coming up, we have a talk with Stina Soderling, who does research on queer land movements in the United States. And Benjamin Saunders, who's from Long Island University, will talk about his research in psychology on right-wing authoritarianism um, and the NYPD's stop and frisk movement, um, policies. So with that, I will stop my screen sharing and turn back to Kate, so. Thank you, Elvis. Um, thank you also to Chris for being with here with us today. I'm very excited and thank you to all to it for attending. Um, I actually had the pleasure of visiting QZAP in 2014. Um, I stopped there right before American Library Association's annual conference and was able to have a slumber party in the zine library. First and only time I ever slept overnight in a library. Um, it was a wonderful experience and so I'm so happy that you all can learn a bit more about QZAP today. Um, and so Chris, I just wanted, wanted to get the ball rolling a little bit and asking if you might please be able to explain um, a little bit about QZAP um, for those who might be less familiar with, with the project and its mission. Sure, uh, so QZAP initially started as a website in 2003. Our inspiration uh, came out of uh, activism that we were doing, uh, Milo Miller and I were doing in California. So we, even though we're based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin right now, we initially met uh, as sort of, you know, folks who had migrated to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and I have family in California. So for, for me, moving from the Midwest to California and back again is the real issue. Uh, and so we were a part of a, a, a radical queer conference called Queer Eruption. And the uh, premise behind those uh, are that uh, an ad hoc group of radical queer folks get together, and this was a, a, a title that was used around the world. 
so that we, um, prior to the 2001 San Francisco Bay Area, it had been in places like London, New York, Amsterdam, and after ours, it was in uh, places like Vancouver, um, and I, I'm trying to think of, there are a couple of other places uh, that hosted them after us. And the idea is that it was non-hierarchical, it was, it was um, autonomous and collectively organized. And throughout the process for uh, establishing like what we were going to do with the, I think three or four days that we had planned for this event, we had several different organizing meetings and they were all run as, you know, sort of anarcho collective type meetings are. And within each of those meetings, different topics would come up uh, as we were planning events, or discussing what types of events would work well for this the queer eruption. And in some of the conversations, there were definitely gaps in, in knowledge of the people participating in these discussions. And uh, occasionally they would get to levels of extreme frustration. Uh, for me personally, I took a lot of offense to some of the ways that people were talking about accessibility. Uh, in, if you think about this as being 20 years ago, um, and we, we uh, our conversations about accessibility are very natural, and I mean, they still need work, but they're, I think they're much more accessible now. 20 years ago, we were still at a place where people were kind of, you know, had kind of their solutions were very offensive, and I'm not gonna go into detail about them, uh, but they were, you know, there were lots of things you know, that were problematic about those, uh, you know, what, what people knew and didn't know. Um, I remember one meeting even devolved about what, what does queer mean? And if you think about sitting in a room of radical queer people that you have to take a, a, an entire meeting to define what queer is, that, that, that there's some level of, of education and knowledge that was missing. Milo and I both came from queer zine culture. Uh, Larry Bob Roberts, who uh, uh, had his um, Queer Zine Holy Tick Clamps and Queer Zine Explosion, he was also one of the uh, collective members. And there were several other people, too, who were adjacent to Queer Zine communities. So Milo and I were, you know, back at home um, after one of these meetings, and we were like, wow, you know, the ideas about X and so that came up in the meeting today, I remember reading a zine in the 90s that really kind of broke this down and it was, was my education for this topic. And I went literally to my closet and <laughs> grabbed a bin uh, where I kept my queer zine collection. Mm. And because Milo and I uh, were tech kids, uh, we both kind of came up in, in Macintosh and Apple uh, uh, sort of ecosystems in terms of tech and uh, uh, you know the, the hardware that we ran and, and the software that we knew uh, we we weren't afraid of technology and we also did not we didn't put zines as paper objects and the internet and, and the rise of like email and websites and list serves as two opposites and diametrically opposed. We saw that they, they sort of helped each other. Queer zines as a genre, uh, if I take just a second to tie it back to the history of radical publishing. So by the 1970s, you get uh, several different, uh, you know, sort of radical queer movements and out of those, uh, things like newspapers, newsletters, and then with the punk era in the late 70s, you get zines. So, you know, sort of cheaply photocopied, uh, small circulation, uh, stapled, uh, sometimes original content, sometimes like cut and paste graphics, but all very vital and important. And so we came out of that culture and thought, you know, wow, in, in the late 80s and into the 90s, when there was a, a real surgence of queer zines happening, the internet was part of the ways, uh, or was one of the ways that we built networks. 
to distribute and communicate with each other. So zines already had its own little kind of network that you traded through the mail mostly, and you would find other zines through uh, like Maximum Rock and Roll, which was a, a big punk uh, uh, magazine uh, that was self-produced in, in San Francisco. Uh, Fact Sheet 5, which uh, was a compendium of all sorts of different genres of zines. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Larry Bob started Holy Tick Clamps as a way just to uh, identify and sort of bring a list of queer zines together in one place to make it easier for people to find. And at that point, after Queer Eruption happened, uh, it, we were still in the Bay Area and you know the, the first dot-com bubble that kind of brought us there had burst and we decided to leave. Uh, Milo came back here to Milwaukee, which is their hometown, uh, and uh, I came about a year later, so at the end of 2002, and we spent the first part of 2003 sort of hashing out what, uh, what QZAP might be, what form it would take. Uh, I went to uh, my first Portland Zine Symposium in 2003, and that was a huge influence. We had one of the breakout sessions was just a group of us talking about our connections to queer zines, queer zine history, our fandom about queer zines, Larry Bob was part of it. I, um, I was added to that group, um, even though I, like, I, I just, at that point, I was just a zine editor from the 90s. I hadn't really done any work uh, that was current at that time. And then at the uh, end of 2003, we had our, the first iteration of our website, uh, which was bare bones. We took uh, zines from our collection that we really liked and we made PDF copies of them. So uh, the idea was uh, that it would, the, the website would serve sort of like a library uh, or a, a, a kind of a virtual info shop so that you could see uh, you know, a small selection of zines that were you know, hand selected and you know, you know, kind of get a sense of what queer zines are and what some of the classic ones were. By, the, by 2003, a lot of the, the late 80s, early 90s zines weren't even being published anymore. Uh, if you, you know, weren't one of the lucky 25 people who received a copy of whatever title, you, you might never have seen uh, you know, these, some of these legendary titles. Um, and so from there, we were very fortunate that people took a, a, an immediate interest in our uh, uh, project and we were featured in uh, our neighborhood newspaper, uh, the River West Currents. Uh, and then from there, we, we hooked into the uh, Zine Fest circuit. So we started to uh, go to places uh, around the country and eventually around the globe to uh, basically uh, you know, sell our own zines and take the little postcard that talked about our, our little website with a couple of zines on it. And the whole thing just snowballed. And as we progressed through the early aughts, we were fortunate to have a lot of people who were very uh, thrilled to see that these zines were, were like, you know, sort of, uh, seeing the light of day through the website and, and having a global audience instead of just kind of a local or a very micro audience. Uh, then as uh, we sort of added more zines to the website, uh, the, the focus started to shift. We were fortunate to be the recipient of zine collections. So people who had queer zines in their house, or like me, in a plastic bin in their closet, realized that, like I did, those, those collections weren't really doing much if they weren't being shared. And so we were able to, uh, we kicked off with the first uh, collection that came from uh, a man who had, who had passed away, who was a radical fairy, 
he was involved in a lot of um, extreme radical uh, groups like Earth First um, and had a lot of good um, like background in like uh, gender politics and of course coming from the radical fairy world uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, spiritualism. Um, there was a great uh, uh, Sander Katz, uh, one of, like, before he was doing cookbooks, was doing zines. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, re we started to realize that we could also be a home for people's zine collections, not just ours and the ones that we were collecting at zine fests. So soon, the corner of our dining room where QZAP started as the, just a desk and a file cabinet grew to two file cabinets, which then grew to, to six file cabinets. And we suddenly were like, okay, we not only have like now hundreds of zines, we have people emailing us, asking us if we accept interns and how they could help with the project. And so we started inviting people to come and intern at, at basically doing the website work at our house and offering them dinner because that was part of the sort of, because uh, QZAP, I should, should add, is a, uh, exists solely as a volunteer uh, sort of project. There are, we are not a 501c3, not, uh, not a nonprofit. We're not business. We are basically queerzine makers and fans who come together to do the preservation and interpretation work. So it's all done kind of in, in the, the punk rock scale of economy and zines that, uh, you know, basically, you know, you sell for a dollar or you give them away. So we kind of kept that philosophy in inviting people in to work on the project. And lo and behold, when our dining room kind of was being taken over by you know, even more zines, we had an opportunity in uh, the house that we live in here in Milwaukee. And you can kind of see behind me a little bit of the architecture. So my neighborhood was developed in the 1880s. And of course, remember that uh, Wisconsin and, and where we are in Milwaukee was originally indigenous land that was stolen. Uh, so by the, the grace of those folks, you know, we are here today. Uh, and in sort of modern history in the 1880s, this neighborhood was developed and became a home for working class German and Polish families uh, who worked in tanneries and our street, in fact, uh, which is called Fratney Street, is uh, coincidentally, uh, Fratney was a radical uh, um, political uh, newspaper publisher who emigrated from Germany uh, as part of uh, like leaving Germany to come to America to find more freedom to express his, well, today we would call them, uh, you know, we wouldn't call them radical views about labor. Uh, he, you know, he was very, uh, you know, sort of uh, forward thinking. Uh, so we have a great uh, uh, sort of history and, and place even within our own house. Uh, so we took over the basement, uh, what was supposed to be just a, we move into the basement apartment, give it a coat of paint, and, you know, that's it. We discovered that it was a far worse situation. Um, uh, the, the, ha the and we own the house, or Milo owns the house, uh, so it was up to us to basically decide to renovate this entire space. We gutted the two-bedroom apartment that was here and created a large open room, which today is very messy. So I'm not going to show you as much of it as I normally would like to. Um, and the pandemic has kind of caused a slowdown at QZAP, so uh, uh, some of the stuff is just piling up and not happening in, in the ways that it would if we were working uh, sort of on a regular schedule. So with the move to this space, that's when we transformed into the community-based archive that we are today. And that's kind of where I'll, I'll leave the story. We can pick up uh, some more of the threads. 
uh, but now we have this great physical space. It's not open to the public because we are in a residential home. Uh, we have wheelchair accessibility only to the front part, so people can come into the, the archive space, but the restroom would not be accessible. And so therefore, we didn't feel comfortable opening to the public uh, for that reason. And why we have uh, programs that we do. And as uh, Kate and Elvis spoke earlier, they've been uh, here as visitors and, and we offer a residential experience for folks who want to come and do more extensive research with our collection. Uh, we, it's a formal uh, program called the Residency Program and takes place during summer months. QZAP doesn't have central heat. It's one of the things we lost in the renovation. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we kind of keep it during the warm uh, uh, climate months here in the Midwest. And you really do, you get to sleep right next to the zines. I have, I have occasionally come down and found folks like in their pajamas with, with a semicircle of zines on the, on the futon couch that folds out into a bed. And you could, you could reach over even into, and I'll, I'll sort of gently so we don't get a little vertigo here. You can kind of see even from where I'm sitting on the couch, there are file cabinets right within reach yeah. so that you can, <laughs> you can kind of just lay in bed and read scenes. <laughs> It sounds lovely. Yeah, we have um, Kelly Wooten in the chat is enthusiastically endorsing the uh, slumber party uh, QZF. So <laughs> definitely, yeah, we have we have lots of fun uh, when when Kelly was here. And in fact, all the residents, we uh, it tends to be a, a more curated experience. So it's there's no open call, uh, mm -hmm. and people that we don't know are often just referred to us through our connections. Uh, in zine worlds, library worlds, archives, uh, and we've had people from all over the world. Um, one of our first residents was a dear friend of mine, Rachel House, uh, who people <laughs> may know from her comics uh, zines, uh, and we, we had a great time. So she and her partner, Joe, uh, came uh, over and they spent they were actually, I think it had been the longest uh, of our residents that so they were here for about two and a half weeks. And it was a great experience to uh, uh, kind of, um, we made lots of fun discoveries. There's a great set of photos. Uh, we, we ended up getting a box of zines from somebody, maybe it was from Larry Bob during her stay. And so we cracked him open and, and I think Joe was taking pictures of us as we were going, oh my God, look at this. <laughs> And, and Rachel finding work that she'd kind of forgotten about, that she'd sent off to some zine, and it got published, but she didn't, she'd never known that, that they actually followed through with publishing it. And so that's, uh, you know, again, one of our um, lovely things about QZAP is a lot of folks come here even just to, to see themselves, uh, if not in a general sense, sometimes even in a very specific like this is this is work they put out in the world and it's coming back to them now preserved in an archive so chris um given that you were just talking about having so many you know exciting collections within qzap i was wondering if you might want to share with us a little bit about some of your most exciting zine related research finds um so it could be collectible zines or just unusual items that you've crossed your path that you know you most like to share with the audience Sure. Uh, one of the uh, things that I alluded to before, and I think I will actually take that time now to uh, sort of take us over to uh, one of our uh, most recent collections, and I'm going to kind of, again, not, uh, not to uh, induce vertigo here in, in moving the camera a lot. Uh, so, the zines that you're, uh, so the file cabinets, the stereo, and everything you're seeing here is uh, to date our largest collection, which also includes vinyl. So we have exciting things like records from Babes in Toyland, uh, Bikini Kill, <laughs> and this is like a very zine expansive interpretation. I like it. <laughs> it is. And that, that's one of the things that being a living archive allows us to do 
is that we can expand what we're doing as the need arises. And so the, the zines that are in here make up what is called the Billy Rain Collection. Uh, so Billy Rain is a person who was involved in the original uh, Riot Girl scene, and I believe based in DC. Uh, they were also, I believe, behind Riot Girl Press. And this was a great connection. So as I said, it was, it's one of the most recent large collections that we received. And it was facilitated through, of all things, a Facebook post. So Billy Rain and one of their friends had posted in a Facebook group, and I can't remember which group, that Billy wanted to get rid of their uh, zine collection, wanted to donate it, and where, where, should, where should this go? And we were one of the uh, groups that were tagged and I jumped in right away, not even, not even really having a clue what this was, but I was intrigued by the, the notion that a couple of different people had tagged us for this specific post. And so I jumped into the conversation and sort of was like, oh yeah, let, you know, let us know what, you know, what are the titles you have, what, you know, what, what parameters uh, for, um, you know, how many zines or, you know, what, what you'd like to see with the collection. And also too, if we can help with any uh, expenses related to getting the collection here to us. And we've done that before. We um, uh, initially started, that was a uh, feature that we did uh, in oh, probably about 10 years ago. We, we picked up a bunch of zines from a zine maker uh, or, and collector in the Czech Republic uh, and paid for the postage to get those zines from the Czech Republic here. So we were no strangers to like, hey, we'll, you know, we'll send you money for postage. And in this instance, the collection was so large that the, the, um, the, the zines alone, when I, I added up kind of a rough total from the shipping labels, there were 35 pounds in three different boxes. Oh. And that didn't, at that time, include all of the vinyl that I just showed you and the mixtapes. Milo happened to be going to Seattle, which is where Billy Rain lives now, and they met, and Milo picked up all the vinyl and schlepped it back with them from Seattle on the plane. <laughs> so we ended up with this amazing collection that we, we have barely even scratched the surface. Um, one of our, our first collective members uh, was a huge, like she, she actually used to buy the Bikini Kill zine when it was first published and was a huge fan. Uh, she was a zine maker as a teenager. Um, she ended up working with us here at QZAP. Um, and then I was able to uh, uh, suggest that she be interviewed for a position where I work at the Tool Shed, which is a uh, woman owned, friendly to all gender sex toy store. So in addition to my work at QZAP, I'm a sexuality educator. And so, you know, Riot Girl zines have always been favorites of ours. And to be able to have this collection is just amazing. Because a lot of the um, Riot Girl materials have ended up in the Fails collection. So folks in, in New York might have seen it or kind of know about um, uh, Kathleen Hanna's papers, and I think that there's at least one other Raya girl whose uh, papers ended up there. Uh, but in those those sorts of archival uh, scenarios, those are places that you're probably going to have to have some credentials uh, to go into, and when you get there, you'll have to sign in, and maybe you'll have to wear gloves. Maybe you do not get anything to write with or you only get a pencil uh whereas in marked contrast <laughs> you know you we have uh, you know, <laughs> open drawers i call as um uh, uh, i'm i'm in a radio interview where i i say we're a sequin glove archive <laughs> no, 
like that for all the artists out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, because we're zines are always hands on. They mm -hmm. we we've taken a few steps to do some preservation work on some of them that have come to us with a you know a little bit of damage. But, but you know, we're zines were meant to be handled. They were meant to be flipped through uh, and and used in those ways. And we want to make sure that as long as they're being used and, and not uh, they're not uh, damaged or anything, that that they're still accessible. Uh, you know, for people to just kind of flip through on their own, yeah. and then you could kind of see next to it. Um, Milo ended up building a. Um, out of a Raspberry Pi, uh, basically an audio. Chris, you're breaking up there momentarily, but let's see if you resolve. Chris, it looks like you are temporarily frozen. I'm gonna, as you unfreeze, um, I was gonna ask the audience um, to drop in the chat if you have a first zine that you read, and I was curious to ask that question of you too, Chris. Um, but if folks wanted to list in the chat like what the first scene they read was, that would be cool just to kind of get that sense. Um, and Chris, I think you might be unfrozen now, but uh, let's see. Okay. There we go. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, good. <laughs> From this end, so uh, I just just a brief. So okay. Um, yeah. So the uh, getting back just to. To finish up on the Billy Ranch. So that, uh, you know, that because queer zines are adjacent to so many others, especially music and film. And this is a great way for us to uh, give us in some ways a more holistic experience because the, uh, the music that came along with these zines told us these are the things I listened to while I was making this. And the, and the mixtapes that friends that you know, world uh, send to them. So that's uh, you know that's kind of one of the uh, again just really easily expand what work that we're doing to incorporate something really incredible when it comes along. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, zines have such a secret and rich history. And um, I think what I love about QZAP is that I didn't fully know that there were so many queer zines out there. And I didn't really think of it as a category. So I also remember waking up at QZAP and being like, oh my God, this is a revelation. Um, but yeah, um, I think um, maybe you had a couple of zines to share that you have on hand, but it would be great just to see some if you're able to hold some zines up to the camera for folks. Um, Definitely. Yeah, thank you few that are uh, uh, able to do is uh, recraft narrative. So when, when you, you it's culture uh, uh, and that's true in especially in the 1970s, like there weren't really a lot of, uh, like you won't see that term out there until the 80s. And so sort of led into queer zines, fan zines from, really uh, out of things, um, so in the 1960s, with the kind of riot in San Francisco, the liberation event that predates Stonewall, fighting back against police brutality in San Francisco, in summer of 1966, the some of in that were street kids who put together their newsletter. They're called Van. You'll start to have copies of the card we actually have. Um, the first location that kind of uh, set the stage. And then originally, if, if we 
application in 2003 the QSAP first started, or in the early, I would have started using around 1985 with a zine called JDs. And years since starting QSAP and uh, sort of uh, talking to people and exploring what zines are there, it turns out that there's an entire history of queer zines before, again, it was, they were called queer zines. So I have a reprint example of something is from 1978. And it is a Chicano gay zine. So the Angeles and everything that you would love about queer zines that came along in the 80s, 90s. I'm not exactly sure what I opened up to, but uh, I just want to cut and paste style. Hi, Chris. Uh, there Sorry, Chris. Are... I don't mean to interrupt, but um, so we're having some trouble with the audio. So um, if you don't mind, we're going to pause just one moment. Elvis and I are going to try to address this. Yeah, I think, Chris, if you are able to sit closer to your Wi-Fi router, that might be the issue on your end, but it's... Um, I'm going to also ask everyone to turn off their video. So I'm going to, if you have a video on, I'll, I'm going to stop your video. So don't be surprised. Um, let's see if that helps. Um, yeah, so Chris, let's try that once again. Okay, so. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. How Chris. does that sound? Yeah, I, yeah. generally we have good connections here. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, are you still having problems? I think we're good now. Your okay. video is slightly fuzzy, so maybe when you hold up a zine, just keep it up for a while so folks can get a chance to look at it. Um, and that should Okay. Be but thank you. Yes. Yeah. So they're Homeboy Beautiful again. And this is a reprint, so that's why it has a really nice color cover. I imagine this would have been in a uh, black and white photocopy at the time. And there were people of color making zines long before the mid 1980s when we really thought that queer zines were starting. So people like Bill Davis, also based in Los Angeles. Uh, so this is Yes, Ms. Davis. and kind of a, a uh, for those uh, who, who might not be familiar, Vaginal Davis is a performance artist, uh, a very uh, multi-talented person who uh, does performance uh, and uh, created uh, several campy zines. And then to get to, this is a copy of JD's. This is JD's number five. So again, a reprint uh, copy, but this would have been uh, produced in the late 1980s. And the uh, zine originated in Toronto, which is sort of an epicenter for a lot of queer zine culture. Uh, it, it was one of the the early years before zine fests were a big uh, deal, there were, uh, essentially they were called queer zine gatherings. And the series Spew uh, was one of those. And the third and final Spew happened in Toronto. So there were, uh, we, we tend to think of Canada as this sort of liberal bastion and uh, uh, you know this this kind of ideal when in reality in Toronto in the 1980s it was not. Uh, the producers of this zine uh, GB Jones and and Bruce LeBruce were on the edges of art and punk and it was violent and scary and they didn't know a lot of other queer folks who were into the things that they were into. 
And they created JDs partly as a way to sort of fake having a scene. So they wanted to uh, basically create this zine that was part reality, part fiction, and kind of create the world that they wanted to see, which was sort of, you know, liberation and, uh, you know, sexuality explored uh, as, uh, you know, uh, freedom without uh, any uh, harassment. Uh, G.B. Jones is probably best known for taking Tom of Finland graphics and creating her own style called Tom Girl of Finland. <laughs> and so she made uh, lots of great drawings. Like uh, the reprint is uh, from a place called Art Metropole. Uh, so it was a gallery in Toronto. I just happened to stumble upon the fact that they were doing reprints for a show of, I think, GB's work. And I was one of the last people to order the, the, the set of reprints and was one of the first times in QZAP in our early history that we outlaid a, a, a significant sum of money to, to pick up. I, I can't remember what it was at that point, like $50 or something, because there were seven issues altogether. Um, I do have a, uh, uh, like the, I still have the bag that it came, because it came, they came in paper bags and it was very adorable. Um, so that, uh, I've got that. And then uh, let's see, some of the other uh, sort of, Canada inspired a lot of great queerzine culture. Um, and one of the ones that, uh, so Elvis and Kate and I had been sort of chatting ahead of time about various zines to pull. And one of the ones on Elvis's list is Gender Trash. So the From Hell portion is actually not part of the title as I, for years I was going around calling it Gender Trash From Hell. The later issues actually clarify that it, it is just gender trash. So the, um, the Canadian uh, Lesbian and Gay Archives, which is now called The Archives with a Q instead of a, a CH for archives, uh, they have a, a few more of the zines than we do. And on, I think you can download them from their website. Uh, but we now have two issues. This is a, from my personal collection. So I was given this by the creators mm -hmm. uh, at SPEW 3 in Toronto. So kind of a great, uh, you know, tying it back to the, the earlier uh, talking about zine events and how easy it is to get zines at zine events. Um, another uh, great zine that's come up is Fuzzbox. So this was produced both in Toronto and Montreal. Uh, and this is, uh, as you see, is 1991. Uh, so this, uh, we actually just had a researcher here who's going to be writing about this and, and came to, to grab some high res scans uh, and, and talk about it. I don't know when the article is coming out, but that, uh, uh, that should be interesting. But I've been, especially with the, this summer and uh, the many protests against police brutality, reminded me of the, the photo spread in here called Queers at War. And I'll just show you this one panel. It is, it's all interspersed with, uh, this is um, from a photo shoot of models. And then later all the graphics were added and it tells the story of police raids at bars and sex clubs, both in Toronto and Montreal in the early 1990s. And some of, some of what I'll show you is a little graphic. So you, you, may, see, you may see some genitalia in art, in art form. But it's, it's a really beautiful, I think, way to sort of uh, reclaim 
talking about something that is very uh, difficult and, and painful. And especially the, those raids really sort of shifted a tide in Canada in terms of uh, uh, people being more aware about harassment by police and helping to sort of change the culture. Uh, and then also uh, another part of our summer and, uh, you know, sort of why we're in, uh, you know, sort of video chat land here is a global pandemic. And queers are no strangers to global pandemics. Uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic, uh, you know, and for some of us who, who lived through that, it, this, this summer has been really kind of a, triggering uh, on some levels. And also it, for some of us, it put us back in touch with the roots that helped us survive that plague. And this is one of the zines that was really important during the HIV AIDS epidemic. Disease Pariah News, or DPN for short. And this was produced solely by people who were either infected, uh, who had zero converted, or had full-blown AIDS. And I'd say about three quarters of the, the people who produce this zine and are featured in its pages have passed away. This is by far one of the, the best um, sort of uh, touchstones for people here in the archive to be able to revisit this record of the life and times of what people were going through during that pandemic. Uh, there are uh, incredibly amazing uh, parody graphics. Like this is the one I remembered because when I got this issue in the mail, I nearly plotzed when I saw Barbie's Dream Hospice. And it's hard to tell in the, this uh, the resolution, but the the Barbie doll has like Carposi's uh, sarcoma uh, lesions, and and they they really went all out to create this sort of like uh, parody graphic, and you can kind of see, you know, room for Ken and Skipper too, and the pages all. And, they, and some of the people who worked on this were professional graphic designers. So the, the, the layouts are by not, you know, uh, 1990s standards really slick. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of zines are just you know, cut and paste and, and uh, you know, really not done professionally. Um, you know, sort of articles like that were self-help um i one of my favorites is um let's see if it's in here so the recipe column was get fat don't die and this is because of wasting so a lot of younger folks who, when we address the HIV AIDS epidemic, may not know of the deletery effects. So basically when uh, folks progress from zero conversion to full-blown AIDS, a lot of times they would rapidly lose weight and end up looking almost like living skeletons. And this was the answer to sort of the wasting syndrome that, that people were going through is sharing high fat recipes and, you know, basically giving you tips on, you know, basically if you're going through this, try this. Uh, there, there, this is, uh, again, is an amazing legacy uh, of that era. And I've been thinking about it all summer and, and sort of revisiting it uh, one of the collections we received this summer as a donation had pretty much, I think, an entire run and some reprint issues. And it also, the person who uh, 
uh, donated that had saved. So each issue would come with a with a little wrapper, and it would say, "Not sanitized for your protection." And that was partly due to the fact that they really did touch upon very, uh, you know, difficult topics, and they weren't. Uh, I, I hate using the term politically correct, but they, you know, that they 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 were very honest and direct about it, and it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't pretty in some in some cases. So I think that you know this is definitely um, one of the best aspects of our collection, and and one that uh, many folks have come to. We've had uh, one of our collective members, uh, Alana Kumbier, has written about DTN in academic articles, and I know other people have come to research uh, specifically just to come and see all of these issues. Uh, thank you, Chris. But then, um, yeah. I just, uh, thank you, that's very powerful stuff. Um, I haven't actually, I don't believe I've held a copy of DPN in my hands, but that's something that I would hope, hope to do soon. Um, and I have a question from uh, an attendee. Um, Mark was wondering, when does the more refi re refined quality of a zine change it from a, a zine to a magazine, in your opinion? Oh, I'm, I'm full of opinions <laughs> on that. <laughs> uh, I, I think it changes when uh, the, the means of how you acquire the zine change. Uh, fancy zines are generally great. And so DPN is one example. I have uh, another one handy that is called Tunten Tinte. So for those folks who speak German, this is a great zine to explore. These, uh, Tunten Tinte was uh, uh, essentially a magazine that came out of uh, German uh, and, and specifically like East Berlin. Uh, they created uh, East German drag queens were creating squatted communities at the time and somehow in a squatted community managed to produce this again sort of like very well designed and laid out artistic zine. What makes these zines rather than magazines is the radical content and also the accessibility. Uh, here in the 21st century, we have much more access to the higher quality uh, uh, reproduction methods. And if folks are taking those higher quality uh, you know, means of production and then charging like $10 for the zine, that generally puts it more toward the magazine category. Zines are, again, it's a scale of economy. Uh, generally and historically, free to low or no cost. So it could be that you traded for zines or that uh, you, know, you, would, you would find them in a, you know, like we have free, little free libraries today. Like you would find them at info shops and be able to just grab a, a copy of a zine. Uh, I think a lot of, it, a lot of that changed here in the 21st century when people were able to like put out really slick things that weren't really radical in terms of content and then also had you know a lot of like you paid a lot for them um and so that that i think is uh, um at least part of the answer for that and i just saw a follow-up to the question flash so if i could um see if i can get to that it's tricky to see all the things in the Zoom. But um, yeah, Mark wanted to know, does the scale of circulation also work into the zine versus magazine equations? So I like this kind of formula of what is a zine. And Definitely. And one of, the, one of the criteria that we came up with early on at QZAP was circulation below a certain number. And I, I think it originally we said like 5,000 because, um, and I'm not sure if there were any legendary zines that ever had thousands of copies, um, but I know that um, people like Larry Bob Roberts, for example, eventually switched over to doing things on newsprint 
and therefore was able to make hundreds, if not maybe a thousand copies of something. Um, and I, I think that, uh, again, that scales. So something that's a smaller scale is more likely to be considered a zine. And we definitely have things in the collection that are, are a little more toward magazine style. We don't emphasize them as much because our, our hearts are more with the underdog and the smaller, the smaller scale. And I think that's, that stays a little more authentic to the culture uh, that, they, that they came from. Um, Chris, uh, Jolie is also, to piggyback on that, Jolie's wondering about how the creators think of the publication. So for example, um, potentially remembering uh, DPN has sometimes called itself a newsletter. Yeah, so that, that also too, I think if, um, if folks self-identify uh, that they're, they're making zines, the, there's one example that's outside of the queer zine world that I, that I and I, I it's, it's awkward because I don't want to pick on, on Yee or Kanye West, but uh, several years ago, Kanye West has a zine. And I was like, is, is Kanye really down at Kinko's at three in the morning trying to figure out a copy scam? I, saw I don't think so. <laughs> so his work, valid, and I've not seen it, but I think that would be more a magazine rather than a zine because I'm sure it was, you know, done not, you know, over the literal photocopier and probably at a, you know, at a production or design team and went to press at a, at a, at, you know, at a very high end printing press. Uh, and there probably is not a master with things that are, have a glue stick on the back of them holding them together. But if he's got that, I'd love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> As but I, I think that's that's also too is zines are a hand craft. I have a, a zine here uh, called Queers Made This. I'll see if I can block out the light from behind. This is it's a, a metallic uh, screened ink on the cover, and this was produced in Montreal. So it uh, is also bilingual and. It will be hard to see, I think, if I flip it open. Do you see the stitching? So this is, this is actually stitched by, by hand, probably on a, a sewing machine. We have some And I think that is also, <laughs> yeah, part of zines are a craft rather than something that you, you know, send to the service bureau af you know, after, after the committee has approved of all the artwork. Thank you, Chris. Um, unfortunately, it's just about five o'clock now. So given, given the time, um, I think Elvis and I just have one final question. Um, and so I think it's a great one to close on because we we're wondering if you could talk a little bit about how in addition to z donating zines, how else can people support QZAP and their mission from afar? Thank you. Yes. So uh, one of the things we do is we actually produce uh, ephemera and zines ourselves because, again, our active mission is that we are creators as well as the people who archive work. And so on our website, there is a whole section uh, where you can uh, buy. Uh, we have pins. In fact, they're even just like right behind me. <laughs> so we've got, uh, there's our, our little button bin that goes with us to zine fests. Uh, so we've got lovely things like, uh, let's see if I can cut the glare down, read queer zines. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like the shirt I'm wearing, so the Circle A Archivist button. And also, again, we, um, one of the things that we do uh, with the residency program is uh, in addition to the, the research work that people are, are here to do, 
we also ask them to contribute to a residency zine. So that can be different from their research project. And it, it's also, it's, it's, it serves a couple purposes. One, it helps them to sort of process the experience that they had while they're here. And secondly, it is a way for folks who are not as familiar with our residency program or the archive to kind of live vicariously through other people's experience here in the archive. And maybe that would generate ideas for them. Uh, it could inspire other research projects. Uh, and we compiled those into zines. Uh, this summer, we have had to sadly uh, suspend the residency program uh, because no one was able to travel. Uh, we, had, we had someone scheduled uh, from as far away as Amsterdam. Uh, but when we resume that, we'll, we'll be, you know, publishing future residencies, experiences, and uh, we have some of the past ones available, and then other zines that we produce as well. Uh, we also, again, we're not a nonprofit, so folks looking to make tax-deductible contributions aren't really able to do that. But we do have folks who are generously uh, sending us, you know, 25 bucks via PayPal or, uh, you know, hey, I got my tax refund, here's some money. And we generally can, because uh, we have our own space, low overhead, we generally, it's our server costs per year. Uh, we're, we have a, um, a our hosting services uh, through DreamHost based in Los Angeles. Um, and then, uh, you know, basically things like utilities uh, are the real, so we don't have a lot of expenses. And occasionally we do get grants, but generally those are through uh, our partner organizations. Our most recent grant was through uh, the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. So Milo is a staff person there and worked with a professor. So she is in the library school and she wanted to do a taxonomy project and she wanted to use zines in our collection to sort of uh, help her and one of her grad students uh, to uh, create uh, lesbian taxonomies and also uh, you know, I think there were a couple of other aspects to the project that they were doing. And so she, uh, Joyce Latham is the professor, she did all of that work on, on her side at UWM and that's, the grants went through them. So that's the other way we sort of uh, can, can thrive is through equitable partnerships with people that can collect that kind of money uh, and kind of be the, essentially like the front for us <laughs> as it were, uh, because, you, uh, you know, larger grantors, uh, they, they aren't interested unless you are a nonprofit or have a fiscal sponsor who can take donations on your behalf. That's amazing. Um, thank you so much. I think um, if people feel inspired to PayPal queues up, you know, we can't stop them. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but yeah, um, there's one more question from Mark that just popped in that I think we can maybe answer and then um, we'll have to unfortunately close our event. But um, uh, Mark says, do you have a bibliography on your website of the articles that have been written using the archive of QSAPs? So that's an interesting library. It is. A, it's a great question. How do you know what my project list is? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I will actually be working on that. We do not have one that is published currently. Um, and probably the best way if you're interested in some of the articles I mentioned, and I, I, do, I do kind of keep a, a rough compendium. I, like I said, I need to sit down and actually uh, um, I want to work with something called, if, if anybody has come across Timelines JS from Night Lab at uh, Northwestern. Um, I recently completed a project for Grinnell College, which is my uh, alma mater, uh, using Timelines to create timelines for multicultural organizations. And so based on the skill set that I developed on that project, I'm going to come back here, uh, stay at home at QZAP, and work on timelines for QZAP history. And uh, our articles and a bibliography 
is one of the timelines that would be in the works for that. Uh, people can reach out to us. Uh, uh, QZAP at QZAP.org goes to the entire collective. Uh, you could reach me directly, Chris, C-H-R-I-S, at QZAP.org. Uh, and if you go to the website, there is also a form on the website that you can, that emails us directly. And we get questions through that, uh, multiple questions every week. So feel free to, to shoot us an email and we love hearing from folks, especially after events like this, where if you still have further questions, uh, if there's zines you're looking for, zines you've heard about that, that we might be interested in, uh, definitely reach out. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been such a wonderful event. Um, we really appreciate your time for being here. And to everybody who attended, thank you as well. Um, your questions and insight were much appreciated. And I, I'm very happy we were able to hold this event. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you again, Chris. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for your questions. And we're seeing a lot of happiness in the chat, a lot of thank yous. So Chris, I, I'll excerpt some of those comments for later. Um, but yeah, <laughs> we really appreciate everyone, all of your participation. Um, but yeah, well, for now, um, goodbye, everyone. Thank you for being here and uh, over and out.